Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate the introduction. Um, and I want to thank everybody else for coming online today. I'm honored that you would take the time out of your day to learn a little bit of surfacing with me. So um, this presentation is all going to be about you know, surfacing. We're not going to do a super deep dive, but we're just going to be looking kind of almost at a top level of the three main methods of surface modeling that make up the lion's share of, you know, surface modeling. So I figured I'd introduce myself. Unfortunately, we can't meet face to face. So that is my face. Um, I'm fighting out of Cincinnati, Ohio. I was born and raised here. Uh, I've been with the company for about four years now, but before working with uh, computer aided technology, I worked in reverse engineering. So a lot of point cloud data, you know, uh, creating solid models from, you know, really rough surfaces. So that's kind of where I got a lot of my, uh, my street smarts from surface modeling, just the reverse engineering field. So let's go ahead and move right along. A lot of folks will ask, when do I use surfacing? All right. I think the better question really is, when do I not use surfacing? All right. Basically, just when it's easier to solid model. So the question you should ask yourself when you're at the crossroads, right? And uh, as you know, whenever you're at a crossroads, take it, you know, make a decision and move on. But uh, whenever you're at a crossroads and trying to decide whether or not you're going to surface or solid model, just to decide, you know, ask yourself the question, is this going to be easy to solid model? Then go ahead and do that because surfacing can be a little tricky. I'll give you an example. Take a look at this right here. This is a cylinder. Uh, that's pretty much one of the simplest things that we could possibly make in SOLIDWORKS, right? It's just one profile, a circle that is extruded one direction. As you can see, I put the feature tree right there. Um, and there's only one feature, right? You make a sketch, you do a feature, boom, done. Now, what would it take to make this in surface modeling? All right, at least one, two, three, four, five, six more things to make the exact same result. All right, so when do I use surfacing? Well, anytime you have to. When do I solid model? Whenever it's easier. All right, so just keep that in mind. All right, so now. We're going to look at the three areas of surface modeling. There's just straight up surface modeling. It's pretty similar to solid modeling, except it's not solid modeling. It is, you know, you're doing all the same functions you would do in solid modeling, except instead of a solid body, you're getting a surface. We'll dig into that a little bit later. Then there's hybrid modeling, where you will use, you know, surface faces sort of as reference. All right, not necessarily built into the model or making up the model, though you could, but you use them for references and end conditions and everything like that. And then at the very back end, I'm very familiar with this, the reverse engineering type of surfacing work, which is called imported surfacing work. Say you get a model from a customer and you need to do some direct editing to just tweak something like that. Well, that is the imported method of surface modeling. So we're going to take a look at all of these today. So I suppose we'll get started here just looking at regular straight of the line surface modeling. So what we're going to do is we're going to be building this kind of bezel thing. And the whole gist of surface modeling, just start to finish, is make all the faces you need, then get rid of the areas of the faces you don't need, and then thicken it so you get a solid body. It's generally a best practice to always have you know, just one solid body when surface modeling, because um, a lot of other programs cannot read an infinitesimally small face, which that's what a surface is, just a flat or curved sort of plain thing that is infinitely small, all right? So let's take a look. We're gonna be building this thing right here. And what I wanna do is just capture one face, general idea of geometry at a time. So we're gonna get these kind of horizontal flats here. I have a sketch already created. And just like I would with regular extrude, I'm gonna just do a surface extrude, mid-plane distance, apply you know, a nominal value there. And there you go, just like you would do a regular surface extrude. So now we got one particular area knocked out for this 
final product. Now let's look at another area. I want to take care of this revolved kind of region, this cylindrical looking thing right here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the sketches. And these sketches, they're uh, open contours, right? As you can see, I want this to be very smooth. So I'm actually going to do a fit spline right here. So there won't be a tangent edge all the way around. We just have very gradual curvature. Where the arc and the line meet, there would be a line on the curved surface if I did not do a fit spline. So I'm just doing a surface revolve. Now I've got this face right here. Alrighty. For my next act, what I want to do is grab uh, these right here, these faces, start making those. That's going to be done with a sweep. It's essentially one profile swept along a path, just like a sweep operates within the regular features, solid features dialog. So I'm going to go to the feature tree. I already have a profile on the path. Just going to grab those. You see the preview there. It's kind of broken up. See all those lines? Those are tangent edges. So by checking on merge tangent faces, you can see I'm getting rid of those tangent edges. Make it look a little, a uh, little more artistic there. A little nicer. Gradual curvature. That's good. All right. So now I want to fill in this little gap right here. And that, you know, with surfacing, you build things face by face. That's what we're doing. So I'm just going to build some more faces. Yeah, this face right here, this is our final product, what we're kind of working towards. I'm going to add this element to it. With surfacing too, it isn't necessarily a best practice to fully define the sketches. I mean, I know that's kind of a heinous crime, but as long as you're overlapping the area that you care about, it's, it's generally accepted that uh, you can be a little sloppier with fully defining your sketches. So we're extruding this right here up to that vertex. So now it's nice and robust design model. So no matter how long that first extrude gets, this uh, second extrude will follow it. All right, now we're going to trim the fat, so to speak. All right, we have all the faces that are required, um, but I want to get rid of the excess material. So what I'm going to do is use a trim surface. Grab the surfaces I want to be trimmed. I'm doing a mutual trim here, so both all surface bodies can be affected. And now I can just click on sections I want to remove. And upon accepting this, it will combine the remaining faces into one body. Before I had, I don't know, three, four, five, six bodies. Now these two are combined into one body. Going to do the same thing, but different. Going to grab uh, the sweep and the body that we just made with the surface trim. So I'm just going to go ahead and do a trim. And instead of saying which sections I want to remove, I'm going to say which sections I want to keep. So I want to keep, uh, you know, this section right here, this one right here. It's actually showing the negative. This is the material that's going to get removed. Hit the green check. There you go. We're moving right along here. See that we're down to two surface bodies. So I'm going to trim a little bit more here. Grab this revolve and the body that was created as a result of the previous trim. And now I'm going to select some sections to remove. Hit the green check. And look at that. So now I've totally trimmed the fat, gotten rid of, you know, the excess surface material that I do not need. But there's only one problem. It is still infinitesimally thin. It is still considered a surface body. All right. See, there's a surface bodies folder. There are no bodies in the solid bodies folder over there to the left. If I were to do a cross section, you know, and just kind of look at this, zoom in a little bit, you can see, you know, there's, there's no thickness. So how do we do that? How do we add that in? Very simple. Just go to surfaces, tab, hit thicken, and then you can apply, you know, the kind of universal thickness that you want to add to the surface. So now you'll see uh, this, this is a solid body. If I do a cross section and zoom in, the thickness was applied to the surface body.
So that's pretty much the straight and narrow of surface modeling, all right? It, it, the main workflow is pretty simple. It's pretty similar to how you work with regular solid bodies, all right? So with surfacing, what you gotta do is create all the faces that you think you'll need, all right? Um, it is a best practice or a common practice to, you know, kind of overshoot there you need. If you recall that last vertical faces that we added, right? I added those underdefined lines. I just drew lines so that they would way overshoot the entire model. And then I knew I could trim them out later. So create all the faces that you need, then trim the fat excess material that you do not need. And then, uh, you know, this is solid works, not surface works, right? So we need to do a thicken at the end to make sure that we end with solid bodies. So that's the general, that's the gist of surface modeling. So we just took a look at surface modeling. We're going to go on to our second section here, our second pillar of surface modeling, which is called hybrid modeling. What this will do is use a combination of the surface modeling that we just saw, and it'll use our traditional solid modeling methods, you know, using different end conditions and whatnot to take advantage of our surface references. So we're gonna make this kind of, uh, this mouse looking thing, it's pretty similar. If you're familiar with what model mania is at SOLIDWORKS World, it's essentially a speed test and how quickly you can model things. Huge competition worldwide. Um, this is based, this model we're making is based off of the 2006 model mania model. One of my favorites, a classic. So, going to get started here. I have a few sketches already made. What I'm going to do is take advantage of the surface sweep functionality. You see here I have a path sketch for this. And I have a profile already created. It's kind of silly seeing a profile being an open contour, but hey, that's surfacing for you. We're going to go ahead and go to swept surface. We're going to select the profile and the path just like I would any regular sweep. Under options, again, I want this to be nice and smooth. You can see selecting merge tangent faces gets rid of those edges. See how we have one, essentially one face, right? So this is going to be my reference surface that I'll use to capture the, I don't know, it looks like a mouse, right? So it's going to, a uh, computer mouse. So it's going to capture that computer mouse-like curvature. So now what I have to do is uh, we're going to go into hybrid modeling now, all right? I'm going to use traditional feature, the traditional feature of uh, extrude boss. So to do that, I need a sketch. And I'm actually going to grab these edges that were created from the surface and bring them into the sketch so that I have nice, robust design intent. So if anything changes with that sweep, then this boss that we are, uh, extrude boss that we're creating will adjust as well. That's the difference between a good and a bad designer, right? Being able to go in and change things without it blowing up. So now to leverage, you know, I could just do a regular extrude boss, but to leverage the shape, I'm going to say up to surface. Which surface? Well, the only one that's here, this one right here. So now this extrude totally filled in the area that is under that sweep. This is a super duper common, uh, super common way to surface model, all right? Just kind of creating a more complex surface and then extruding up to that surface to get that complex geometry that you can't get with any other regular Schmegler loft. So now we're going to do some, uh, you know, basic modeling things to get the shapes that were required for this computer mouse kind of thing. Just going to do a regular revolve so that it will be a solid. Automatically it is merging. So we'll have still one solid body. And I want this to be hollowed out because this will uh, eventually be uh, injection molded. So I'm going to give it a consistent wall thickness here. And we want this to be nice and strong. So what I'm going to do is just add ribs using the rib feature. The rib feature is pretty cool. feels kind of like you're cheating. Basically, anything you... Uh, any sketch or any entity that is in the sketch will have a thickness applied and it will go up to next in two directions for the rib tool. So the rib function, it uh, 
it's kind of like killing three birds with one stone here. So you see it's applying the thickness. I'm choosing the extrusion direction to go inside of the model. Then I'm going to apply the thickness that is applied to the sketch entities. You can see right there. Upon hitting the green check, you'll see it went up to next in the direction that I, the arrow was pointing and applied a thickness. Just going to kind of rotate it around here so you can see it. And there you go. So this is, that wasn't surface modeling. I just like the rib tool. I think it's cool and I wanted to share it with you. So now let's clean up our mess here. 99% of mechanical designers will be done here, but uh, I don't like to have multiple bodies that I'm not using. See the surface body here? We're done with it. We've already used this reference. It's in the feature tree using the reference. If I isolate it, this is still going on infinitesimally on top of the solid model because of that end condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to clean up a little bit and delete that surface body. Now the delete keep body function, it is placed in the feature tree after everything else. So that, sure, the boss extrudes end condition is still applied, but as you, could, you just saw, went over to surface bodies, there is no longer any surface bodies. So now you don't have to worry. Sometimes folks keep all their reference surface bodies in their models, save out a parasolid or a step file to share with their friend who uses a different CAD uh, program and they'll import incorrectly or it'll come up in a 3D print, goofy stuff like that. So it's always a best practice to uh, delete all your reference surfaces. So we just saw hybrid modeling, right? The combination of surface modeling and the traditional CAD modeling. So what do we do? We created reference surfaces that we knew we were going to use. You could do these at the very beginning if you know you're going to use them, or you could use them intermittently between creating regular solid body features. So we created reference surfaces. I used end conditions, the end condition up to surface, or I could have done up to next to create and leverage those uh, reference surfaces. And then because I'm a good person and I like to, you know, keep my models and feature tree nice and clean, I deleted the reference surfaces. So that's a pretty typical workflow there of doing the hybrid surface modeling. All righty. So for my final act, we're going to talk about imported surface modeling. This is also known, uh, you can call this direct editing, all right? It's called direct editing because you are not controlling the geometry from the parametric functions in a feature tree. Parametric just means it's controlled by dimensions and relations, whereas direct editing, it's, it's like you are, you know, it's almost art, right? You're deleting faces, you're adding faces, you're kind of driving curvature, all right? So let's talk about imported models real quick and uh, I'll talk about the file types actually. So Parasolid, if, you're, if we're talking about dummy SolidWorks, or I'm sorry, dummy solid files and you don't have the option to bring in a native SolidWorks file, Parasolid is at the top of the hierarchy of what we call the dummy solid files. All right. This is a universal file that can be saved out of any program, any CAD program, and it can easily be imported into SOLIDWORKS. If somebody says, what kind of uh, file do you want? Step, IGIS, Parasolid, whatever. If you can't get a SOLIDWORKS file, go for Parasolid. Why? Because this is the actual kernel file for SOLIDWORKS. That means there's no database translation, so it's directly read into SOLIDWORKS. You won't have a feature tree, but the geometry and everything will be right there as intended. All right, so, um, you know, technically all SOLIDWORKS is, is, uh, you know, a really, really pretty graphical user interface over lines of code, right? It used to be to do CAD modeling, you would essentially, you know, write your model. You would be typing what your model looked like. Um, thanks to John Hirschek in the early 90s, we have a pretty user interface to create Parasolid files. That's all that's happening here. All right, so Parasolid as king at the top of the hierarchy for dummy solids bringing them in. The next one, next best, is a step file. It stands for, um, it's like 
standard for graphic exchange file, something along those lines. You can fact check me on that. Um, that's the second best one to bring in. Uh, it, it was created independent, I believe, of any CAD program, and it was just uh, you can put your PMI data in step 242 files, so your manufacturing information in those files as well. So it's a good universal file type. Uh, SOLIDWORKS still has to do some translation for it, so it is more prone to import errors, but uh, I mean, you know, probably 0.01%, right? They're pretty good. And then I just files, you're probably familiar, you might be familiar with this. I just originally started out as just wireframe files, right? Just one dimension line representations of things coming in. But now uh, the user, typically depending on what program it's saved out of, the user who is exporting in the iGIS format can define how they want their faces read and things like that. You have a ton of more options, which leaves a ton of more uh, opportunity for, you know, errors in translation. So I just ain't bad, but go for a parasolid if you can't get a SOLIDWORKS file, if you can't get a parasolid, or a SOLIDWORKS file, get a step file. That's all right. It's just a little brief overview from uh, the former reverse engineer. So let's take a look at an imported file. Let's do some things to it, all right? First, what we're going to want to do is match the curvature on the top face, delete these fillets because they're a different size and they came in a little bit weird. See the curvature of this bottom face? That's what I was talking about. I want this to match right up here. You can see it's an imported file in the feature tree. So I'm going to use the delete face command to get rid of the fillets that I want to resize eventually. All right. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go through here. And what's cool about the delete face command is it's a surfacing command, but really what's going on here is we have three options. We could just delete the face and it'll create a hole and convert everything into a surface body. All right. So you see under options there, if I were to just select delete, it would just create a hole where the faces that I have selected were. Now, Delete and patch and delete and fill. The difference between them, um, a lot of people get mixed up and aren't sure what it means. So I'll tell you. For delete and patch, what happens is you delete the faces that are selected, and then all of the adjacent faces will extend until they intersect with each other and stop. So delete and patch, what this is going to do is create almost the... Um, Oh, uh, shucks, what do they call it? The tangent edge. They'll extend to make a corner around the fillet where they're in this particular scenario. Now, for delete and fill, what delete and fill does is it looks at the adjacent edges and faces and adds surfaces there. So if I would have chosen delete and fill for this scenario, it essentially would have just recreated fillets, right? So with delete and patch, upon selecting that, you see I now magically have an edge there. And with delete and fill, that last option, you have an option to uh, select tangency, so it would create a tangent face there. All right, so moving right along, what I'm going to do is start a sketch. And I'm going to be creating a surface in reference to this here that will match the uh, curvature to that bottom face. I almost want them to be uh almost want them to be concentric. Not concentric, parallel to each other. So I you know, I'm assuming I have the knowledge that I have I know it needs to be radius of 30 millimeters. So I'm just going to do, you know, something we did before, a surface extrude with a mid plane, and I'm not really going to measure it. I just want it to be, you know, far enough out on this important model, so that's overlapping. So I have my surface model here. Now, how do I make it the new face? This is a pretty slick functionality that we're about to see. All right, I want to replace this top face with this new surface that I made. So I'm going to go to surfaces, replace face. Makes total sense. Saying, hey, you, this face, be this face now. And just like that, automatically updated. If I were to hide this surface model right here, you can see 
is now, it's almost like doing a retroactive up to next. So that's the replace face functionality. Now that new face is replaced by the surface extrude one that we just created. Because I'm a good person, I'm going to clean up my model a little bit and get rid of uh, this reference face. I am now done with it. I have no need for it. So now in the feature tree, there's a body key delete, and there are no surface bodies. Nice and clean. So then for my final act, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to match this radius on the fillets that are adjacent to the edge here. So I'm going to use one of my favorite tools coming from the reverse engineering world, the measure tool. Just by selecting that face and hitting measure, I have it set up to uh, happen when I hit control M. I'm going to grab that radius right there. And then I am going to select this edge. And because they're tangent, it'll propagate tangentially. So I just have to grab one edge and use the pop-up key, paste in that new radius. It's all about efficiency. Hit the green check, and you see a seamless transition. So I completely changed the geometry of this imported body. All right. A lot of folks, if, uh, you know, pre I, I would have done the same about three years ago. A lot of folks seeing this and having a customer ask to change the curvature of the face, they might have just recreated the whole model. Sure, it would be nice to have a parametric model, but what if this was a one-off? This took... This took no time. This took like seven minutes versus it would probably take an hour to recreate this model. All right. So spend that valuable time with your family. Use surfacing. So for the imported models, what did we do? Well, we brought them in. Hopefully it was a parasolid. Step files are fine, but parasolids are better. We deleted the unneeded faces, the things we don't need. And we used direct editing. We just, you know, kind of grabbed the geometry, did what we want with it instead of, you know, creating parametric features.